In this part three of our mini series on building our own studio monitors, we'll be looking at the cabinet choices we made and how it all came together as a system and where we currently are with our Dolby Atmos setup. But firstly, we want to say a huge thank you to all of you who have watched parts one and two and left us such overwhelmingly positive comments, as well as those who have come in for a listen and given us such honest and incredible feedback. It's been very encouraging, so thank you. And one of the most commonly asked questions has been, how much will they cost? And the answer is, well, we built these for us in here and bringing a product to market is not at all in our area of expertise. And so this isn't going to be a commercial product you can buy from Sweetwater or your dealer of choice anytime soon. Having said that, pretty much every person who's come in and heard them and in many cases worked on them has left the building wanting a pair. So we do have a few ideas for those of you who might be interested and we'll cover some of those later in this video. So do keep watching until the end for that and some measurements. Talking of which, there have been a lot of comments from people wanting acoustic measurements, and that's absolutely fine, but probably where we're gonna get a little bit controversial. If we were to release a monitor into the world as a commercial product, which we haven't, then we would, of course, look to obtain a full set of independent anechoic measurements, even though many of the big players in the marketplace actually don't. But we've built these for us in our room. And whilst we have taken copious measurements throughout the process to aid with both the design and voicing, as well as making sure there are no obvious flaws, the end result of which we will show you later in this video, they are currently very much tuned to this room, the environment for which they were built. But for me, there is only one measurement I care about. I'm a mastering engineer and I have to be able to master a lot of music efficiently and effectively, or I won't earn anything. And the only measurement I care about is the percentage of revisions I get. That's a measurement that tells me everything I need to know about these speakers. And that's been around half a percent on the 14 albums and 150 or so individual tracks I've mastered since I've been exclusively using these. And most of those have been the client hearing the master and then wanting to go back and tweak something in the mix. So at the risk of alienating those of you who've been typing away on the forums and in the comments about the lack of measurements, and whilst understanding and appreciating where you're coming from, I just don't care. No acoustic measurements I can give you are going to tell you about how these work in this studio for me. And a lot of the comments we've received from people saying we don't know what we're talking about, we don't know what we're doing, have come from people that clearly haven't even digested the information in the videos. We've even had someone questioning why we've been using the aluminium, magnesium, mid driver and tweeter and slagging off the use of those for use in a studio monitor. Well, we haven't used those, we used silk. So to that particular individual, you haven't even watched the video and comprehended the information in it before starting spouting off on forums. And this is why I don't do forums. I've never read one that doesn't descend into a pathetic slagging match. So to the handful of you who have been squawking on about what we've been doing wrong and why these can't work and why they must sound like crap because we haven't published a white paper, create a measurement that will enable me to predict how happy my clients will be with my work and then loan us a pair of the speakers that you have built with those measurements and we'll work with them and then get client feedback and see how those measurements correlate and then we'll make a video on it. Now I appreciate the importance of measurements when you're building and developing something like this or when you're building a studio but I also appreciate the unimportance of that and probably more so and naysayers tell us why we were wrong and why we and the very qualified community of experienced individuals who have helped us with this project have absolutely no idea what we're talking about in the comments below we do read them all but don't forget to send us what you made anyway rant over let's dive into the cabinet design we chose for these and why The mids and highs are relatively straightforward as the mid drivers and tweeters are sealed at the back and so they don't even require a cabinet at all. So the cabinet only really affects the bass driver and that's crossed over at 400 Hz. 
The loading we've ended up with is a sealed enclosure or acoustic suspension design. And the reason for this is very simple. We didn't like any of the other designs we constructed. And the sealed enclosure offers an accurate, tight and completely unhyped low end response with a very smooth and gradual roll off. Another consideration was that using a sealed enclosure means we didn't have to find space for a port or for a pair of passive radiators. But let's skip back a bit for those of you who might not understand how a speaker driver and cabinet need to act in harmony to form a complete system and give a very simplified basic understanding of how a speaker cabinet works. This is a base driver. The side you're likely most familiar with is the front and the cone. Around the back there's a large magnet with a circular gap inside and in this gap is a coil of wire that's attached to the cone. When an electrical signal is fed into the coil of wire it moves within the gap in the magnet and it moves the cone. This creates a pressure wave and we hear sound and the sound corresponds to the frequency that's being fed into the coil. Feed this a 50 hertz sine wave and the cone oscillates at 50 times a second and generates a 50 hertz tone, the volume of which will increase as we feed in a higher voltage. So fairly simple, but there is a problem with the cone. It has a front and therefore it also has a back and when it's generating a positive pressure wave at the front it's generating a negative one at the back and vice versa and as the wavelengths of base frequencies become longer and more omnidirectional as we go down the frequency spectrum the negative pressure wave coming from the back of the cone wraps around and cancels out the positive one being generated at the front and the result of this is that we don't hear any bass it cancels out and the more energy we feed in well the more we're generating the front and the back so it still cancels out and that's why boosting a low end frequency that's caused by your room response at the listening position with EQ just doesn't work you can't just pump so much energy into it that it won't cancel out anymore it still cancels out so we need to do something with that rearward energy to have an effective bass driver and we really have two options here try and get rid of it altogether or try and use it to our advantage and actually use that rear energy to increase output the most common way of using that rear energy is in a ported design, as seen in most studio monitors. This features a port, usually at the front of the speaker, the surface area and depth of which are tuned to a specific frequency which acts as a Helmholtz resonator. The advantages of this include increased efficiency and greater SPL, but one of the disadvantages is that you have to tune the port, so it works over a fairly narrow frequency range. This means that you can end up with a very uneven low end, boomy sounding bass and a ported design generally has a much steeper roll off towards the bottom of its range. Another common issue with many ported designs is that it can take a certain amount of cone movement to move the slug of air inside the port and so you can lose a lot of bass information at low listening levels. You also need to tune the port to the volume of the enclosure so that they can act as a cohesive system and as a general rule the lower the frequency you wish to achieve the larger the enclosure will need to be. We've all blown into a bottle and achieved a tone and that tone is largely dependent on the volume of the bottle and the shape and length of the neck as well as the surface area of the opening and we need to agitate a certain amount of air to generate the tone. If we reduce the air volume of the bottle by adding some liquid, we change the tuning and generate a higher tone. <laughs> oh, it's still warm. 
And that's basically how a ported speaker enclosure works. It's a system that has been used for many decades and we, as a human race, know so much about how ported enclosures work, it's very easy these days to model it in software to get a good representation of how the system will perform in the real world. But get it wrong and you'll know about it. If the port is too narrow, the velocity of air moving inside it can become very audible and manifest itself as chuffing, a very unpleasant sound that distracts you from what you actually want to hear coming out of the speaker. To reduce this, you need to increase the surface area of the port. But when you increase the surface area, you also need to increase its length and the volume of the port must be calculated and subtracted from the overall volume of the enclosure. So to widen the port to decrease its side effects and also lengthen it, you generally need to also increase the cabinet size. And this is why a ported design wasn't working for what we wanted to achieve. I went through many iterations of cabinet design when trialing ported enclosures, and only one really worked, a design very similar in size to the cabinet that we have now, but with a six and a half inch driver. In fact, this one. After having spent weeks tuning the port, this sounded fantastic and super smooth and accurate in the low end with a flat response and a nice roll off from around 40 hertz down. But we just couldn't get the SPL we needed from the six and a half inch driver. And to add a second base driver, you need to double the volume of the cabinet and have that second driver in its own partition in its own enclosure with its own port. And that's why our trusty ATC SEM 200s, you've got two ports. This cabinet is actually two enclosures with a common baffle. Each base driver has its own enclosure and its own port. It's effectively two cabinets stuck together. So back to the eight inch base driver we went and the cabinet just needed to be way too large to effectively incorporate a port that would give us the response we needed. We also looked at transmission line designs of which we're huge fans, the Kerr Acoustic K100 being some of the finest loudspeakers I've ever had the pleasure of working on with a super tight and accurate low end and that's also capable of extreme trouser flapping at high volumes. But this was impractical to incorporate into such a shallow design of cabinet without heavy compromises. But from the start, I had an inkling, a gut feeling that a sealed enclosure would be best for us and had chosen a base driver that could be used in both sealed and ported enclosures for prototyping. And not all are suitable for both, so. So hang on a minute. How do you know if a base driver is suited to a ported enclosure, a sealed enclosure or both? You look at the feel small parameters. The feel small or TS parameters are a set of electromechanical parameters that define the specified low frequency response of a loudspeaker driver following two decades of research by A.N. Thiel and Richard Small, inspired by an original paper published by J.F. Novak in 1959. These are too complex to cover in this video, but we will look at a handful that apply to the sealed enclosure design we ended up with. A sealed enclosure or acoustic suspension system is arguably the easiest of the loading principles to get right and also allows for a certain margin of error. Essentially, all you have to worry about is the volume of the box and how much rearward energy might be reflected back through the cone, causing unwanted distortion. And choice of cone material can help with this as well. Because the enclosure in a sealed enclosure is sealed or airtight, hence the term sealed enclosure, the volume of air within it acts like a spring. When the speaker moves, it pushes against it like a spring and then it's pushed back by the spring, hence the term acoustic suspension. If the volume of the enclosure is too small, the air spring is stiffer and this affects the driver's ability to move freely and therefore the transient response. If the volume is too big, then effectively it becomes an infinite baffle design. If you get the volume right, then you can achieve a design that has a very smooth and natural roll off at around 12 decibels per octave, a fantastic transient response with minimal overhang, as the air spring can also act as a brake to help stop unwanted cone vibration once the signal has stopped, and it also makes cabinet construction very easy. But you don't get something for nothing, and the trade-off is a lower efficiency. We're not using the energy coming from the back of the cone, so a sealed enclosure is far less efficient than a ported or transmission line design, meaning we need a more powerful amplifier to achieve the same output and a driver that's capable of handling it. Hereafter did follow a tedious 40 minute section on TS parameters that was so long and drawn out, even the cat got bored and left the room. So we've cut it out and replaced it with 10 seconds of lovely puppy footage. It was then time to test the system with both critical listening, feedback from others, and take measurements. 
We've mainly used the Trinov to take measurements as that's one of the reasons we bought it. And these measurements were verified by the lovely Doug when he came in with his smart rig. Now, bear in mind that these measurements were taken in this room, currently the only place in the world in which these speakers exist. So the only environment we currently care about. We can see from the before and after amplitude curves that the speakers are pretty flat to within around one and a half decibels from where the mid drivers and tweeters take over from the bass driver at 400 hertz. The low end is a little more lumpy and that's down to the room and we can see from the after curve that the Trinov has sorted that admirably. Looking at the phase response below these, we can see that it's pretty remarkable. Usually you can expect to see issues around the crossover points, but here there's nothing, just an irregularity at the aforementioned 140 hertz, which is being caused by the room and giving us the slight dip we can see at 140 hertz on the amplitude curve. Now this 140 hertz issue is far worse outside the listening position, so the best thing we can now do is to use the data from the Trinov to go back to the source of the problem, the room, and try and resolve it. If you play a 140 hertz test tone and walk around the room, it's loudest in the front corners, and 140 hertz has a wavelength of around 2.4 meters, so we should easily be able to absorb that by using porous absorbers placed in the corners. And that's something we'll do in a future video. But let's briefly talk about the actual cabinet construction. I trialled two types of material for the cabinet construction, MDF and moisture resistant MDF. And my top tip for anyone thinking of working with MDF to make a speaker cabinet is to use the moisture resistant stuff. This is denser, more stable, and because the core is less prone to turning into cardboard or Weetabix when you cut it, far easier to machine and work with. I don't own a table saw and don't have the room or really the inclination to get one. So I got most of the MDF pre-cut, which saved a huge amount of time. The panel I did have to cut myself, I just cut a few millimetres oversized with a handsaw and then trimmed the cuts with a flush trim bit in a router against the straight edge to ensure a perfect 90 degree angle. The cabinets were glued and clamped with each pass being left overnight to dry and then sealed on the inside with silicon to ensure there would be no air leaks. So all of this has resulted in a speaker that can comfortably pump out a continuous 110 decibels of clean audio at the listening position, has the best sound stage, stereo imaging, and solid phantom center we've ever heard from any studio monitor we've ever worked on. We recently completed the lateral units for our Atmos setup and have them in a 7.1 configuration around the room. We were planning on having a nine speaker setup at ear level for a 914 system, but with the incredible dispersion of the Bliesma tweeters and mid dome alongside the time alignment capability of the Trinov, I'm not exactly sure we actually need those extra two speakers. Currently, the phantom image between the left or right speakers and the side channels is phenomenal, and you pan an object around the room and the speakers just completely disappear, which was exactly the result we wanted. It sounds like there are speakers in between the speakers. So the next step is to construct a slightly different cabinet design of the same volume using the same complement of drivers for the height channels, get a four channel upgrade for the Trinov, and look at interface options between that and the host computer. But back to the how much do these cost question, and should we release this as a product? These cost us £1,539.25 per speaker at retail price excluding tax. If this were to be a commercial product, by the time you've factored in a profit for us, manufacturing costs, distribution and retail margins, packaging and warranty and after sales obligations, it would be a challenge to get them out at under £10,000 a pair. This puts them in direct competition with the likes of the ATC SCM45 and PSI A25M we've reviewed on this channel, and we think that would offer very good value, as we far prefer working on these. I now want Mark to build me a pair for my room. But we haven't got the time, finances or resources to launch these as a commercial product and don't wish to become a speaker manufacturer. And we're all about value, so we've had some ideas that could offer even greater value to those that may be interested in owning a pair or several pairs if you're getting into Dolby Atmos. This is the cabinet I designed and constructed to evaluate the Bleesma mid and tweeter with our quested main monitors whilst I was still faffing around trying to get the base end right. This with a base driver in it instead of the Bleesma mid makes a nifty little two-way speaker that's actually relatively flat all the way down to around 80 hertz and with the superb Bleesma high end. 
This would make a great little two-way monitor for those who are just starting out or working in small rooms at home or for B rooms in larger studios, for example. And it would also make a fantastic surround speaker, although not quite up to Dolby's specifications, certainly in terms of SPL for Atmos purposes, but you'd need some base managed subwoofers with it. But because this can become this, then it can also become this, which means it then becomes the mum the world's first modular upgradable monitor. As a two-way, it's primarily a passive design, but with an active option available for those who want to keep it as a two-way. But when it forms part of a three-way system, it then becomes fully active and with a variety of base cabinets that would offer varying options for orientation, a stand-mounted landscape near field such as this, or an on-wall design or a floor stander or a mastering option with twin subs such as we have here. We think this is a unique idea and one that would involve a fair bit of engineering and thinking literally out of the box to make properly work, but we've kind of done it and it kind of works. At the moment it attaches magnetically and has a four pole magnetic connector on the back so you don't even need to plug a cable in, it just snaps into place into the base cabinet of choice. So this could be our product in the future, maybe. But let us know what you think of the idea down in the comments. But for those who just want a great three-way design, we think the most viable option for us and the most cost-effective for you would be to offer a kit. This would be available in two options. As a CNC'd flat pack, you assemble entirely yourself along with full instructions and a how-to video, or as a fully finished, tested and assembled unit, ready to go. This would be a bespoke product, so the cabinet could be a floor stander similar to what we have here, or a deeper, more traditional stand mount design that is the size of the baffle at the front, and we could offer a variety of finishes. And for our UK customers and those in nearby Europe, we could offer a service whereby we deliver, install, and tune them to your room as we have in ours. For international customers, we could offer the flat pack kit or a set of plans that you can either build yourself or send to your local CNC machine shop to have cut. A flat pack kit would likely cost around £1,500 per speaker in the UK, with a fully assembled, delivered, tuned and installed product coming in at around £2,500, so around five grand a pair. This is manageable for us and would give you a fantastic sounding full range monitor with options to add matching subwoofers and amplifier packs that could be mounted either at the front of the cabinet, the rear of the cabinet or in a rack at far less than the cost of the speakers that we believe stand shoulder to shoulder with these. And of course, if we did release it as a conventional commercial product further down the line, then our early adopters can feel pretty smug knowing that they saved a whole bunch of money. Once again, let us know what you think in the comments down below, and we're going to do a live stream to talk about these and answer your questions on Sunday 16th October at 7 p.m. UK time, so make sure to set a reminder so you don't miss out on that. Like, subscribe, and ding the ding dong, and you'll see us in the next one.